All right, welcome on, bro, for the, was it third time? Third, maybe fourth. I can't even remember now. Yeah, Mongolia. we've been doing this many years, so, uh, you know, a uh, run out of uh, memory of who came on, how many times, etc. cetera. But uh, we spoke about a few things last time. I guess we did touch on, when you were still in Turkey, we touched on, like, life in Turkey and stuff like that. But we can go into more things and more depth this time, inshallah. What I wanted to sure. start with is, you know, I never asked you this because I've known you so long. What do you tell people, like, that you do when you meet new people? What label do you give yourself? It really depends who I meet. I think there's different types of people. So mostly um, people are very interested. When they learn that you're living abroad, they always, like, the number one question is what you do. Or they'll mm. say, are you here for work? Because like when I used to live in Bursa in Turkey, it was a bit weird for a foreigner to be in Bursa, I guess, at that time. And so they were like, are you here for a job? And I was like, no, mm. I have a, I have an online business. That's mm. why I basically say it. And then as soon as I say online business, I always do this as well in case they don't understand. So I'm like typing online business. <laughs> um, and then most people just settle for that. But then there are some right. people that are oh, what kind of stuff are you doing? Like, are you selling uh, Amazon or this or that? So that's yeah. what I basically say to people. Mm, just online business, right? Yeah. What would you like to be known as? The confidence whisperer. <laughs> that's actually, that's quite good. I, I like that. It sounds a lot better than confidence coach and leadership coach and all of these things. But yeah, I was thinking about that recently. I like confidence whisperer, but I haven't come up with anything yet. Right, right. Okay. Uh, so, bro, I wanted to ask you first, when it comes to this topic of, uh, you know, living in different places and stuff, what was your intention moving to first Turkey? Because obviously, firstly, tell me how many years did you live in UK and how many years in Pakistan before you like moved to Turkey? So as far back as I can remember, I lived my whole life in the UK. But when I was 15, uh, my parents decided to move to Pakistan and yeah. I went to Pakistan. It was a big culture shock. Imagine being 15 and you leave all your friends, your family, everything, and you go to another country. Um, and it was terrible because... It was a time when there was no internet. So it was a very different life. It was a village life. And yeah. I studied in school there for about two years. But it was a life-changing experience for me because it like reshaped my mindset towards education, all this stuff. But it also gave me, I guess, the the seeds of being able to live somewhere different to where I grew yeah. up. And I think yeah. it's very unique because most of my friends, family, they never went through that. But me, my brother, obviously my family, we went through that where we completely picked up our life, went to another place and settled there. So I lived in Pakistan for about mm. two years um, before mm -hmm. I moved back to the UK because I wanted to go uni. So I mm. came back, did college and then mm -hmm. kind of uh, went there. And then I spent the rest of my life um, there. So I lived, uh, I lived uh, in the UK probably around 30 plus years of my life. Mm. So 30 years, but then you did get that taste of living outside. Yeah. Would you yeah. so would you say that that those two years, like just two years, was enough to, you know, just help you or make you a bit more open minded to leaving the UK or didn't play a role at all? No, I think it played a massive role. And when I think mm. about other people trying to leave, I think it can feel like a very heavy thing on your brain to leave the place you've always known and go somewhere else. And I think having that experience definitely made it easier for me and it probably opened my mind towards traveling and mm. stuff as well. Mm, so maybe like if people are thinking about the next generation like let's say they're still like living in the west or whatever that could be something like a good experience for their kids if they could do that whole you know when the people in mecca they used to send their kids out and stuff yeah yeah i mean i heard a lot of people talk about this but i've not really seen people implement it i just have one friend he's from birmingham he's libyan his dad uh asked him uh when he was 15 he said, do you want to go to Mauritania to memorize the Quran? And he said, he was just very simple thinking. He said, if I go to Mauritania, do I have to do GCSEs? He said, no. <laughs> he said, okay. And then he went. So he went yeah. two years Mauritania, living that whole life in the desert, tents. And he memorized the Quran. And uh, two years later, he went back to UK and stuff. And uh, obviously, that's like life-changing experience. Um, yeah. but, but he didn't really didn't seem to miss out education wise. I mean, he didn't go uni, but he got all these, these other qualifications and now he's like a network technician or something like that. So, you know, he's kind of all right. Um, and so, yeah, so you're in like uh, UK, like most of your life in it, very yeah. used to that, very comfortable. Like what was your intention when you left the UK to go Turkey? 
So firstly, I would say that um, I've always thought that traveling was something really beneficial um, and mostly beneficial for the development of children, for their minds, all these kind of things. So I thought traveling was very important. I think mm. me and my wife, um, I remember one of the things we did on after 10 years of being married, we sat down and we said, what's one of our biggest regrets? And I think one of our biggest regrets was actually not traveling enough as well. Mm. Um, and then I also thought that um, you can definitely have a better life uh, outside the UK. So in Pakistan, I experienced a really good life, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, like, you know, in terms of education, in terms of lifestyle, all these kind of things. Um, so from every aspect, I thought there's a re really, really good possibility of having a much better life outside the UK. And I'm not just talking in terms of lifestyle and things like that, but even uh, spiritually and all of those kind of reasons. I don't know exactly what my uh, original intention was. I always try and align my intentions to Allah in some way. So I'm sure there was something of that in there. Um, but our original plan was not to go Turkey, by the way. Our original plan was for Morocco because my wife is half Moroccan. Um, so we thought we would go to Morocco and we would basically check it out, see how it is. But the time I actually chose to move was during COVID. So what happened in COVID is that Morocco said no one is allowed in except Moroccan. So my wife and my kids would have got in, but I wouldn't. So there was no option. And at the same time, I was kind of like moved out of my place. I was living in Nottingham at the time. I moved out of the place. I was in London. Um, and I was like, look, we should just go. We should just go. And um, the only place that was open was Turkey. And so we thought, mm. Turkey, okay. I mean, I've been there like 20 years ago, whatever, but let's have a look. Let's see what it's like. And mm. we just basically made our way there. And uh, we did a lot of research on the internet and we got there and really, we just fell in love with it. We really, really fell in love with so many different things uh, within Turkey. And I remember when I first got there, I was, in, uh, I was near Cappadocia and I met this lady and um, she, no, I was, I was in Pamukkale, which is where the calcium pools are and stuff, right? And I met this lady, she was a, a white American woman and I asked her, how long have you been in Turkey? And she said, I've been living here 12 years. Mm. And that blew my mind. I was like, how can like a, a typical American white person be living in Turkey like for 10, 12 years? And it kind of made me think, whoa, like maybe there's something here. And that's what I found when I, when I started living there. Like I really, really fell in love with a lot of stuff there. And I, and I found it to be an amazing country to live in. Mm. So the white person doing it validated it for you that you are now allowed to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that definitely added something to it, right? Like if, if people who are not Muslim are, are willing to live in this Muslim country and all that kind of stuff, I think that that was quite big for me as well. Mm. So because of that, like we just accidentally fell into Turkey, really. Um, mm. And then we just we just ended up like living there. Like I said, we loved it, and we just we just lived there. So, would you say it was like officially a hijra plan or no? Assalamualaikum. A few years ago, the conversation about masculinity and Islam popped up, and of course, I took a big interest in that. And some of you might know that I actually wrote a whole book on Islamic masculinity. I went to the Quran, I went to the Sunnah, I filtered out the red pill, I filtered out the feminism, and I came down to what a good Muslim man looks like. It's a really good book with tons of stories and examples from the Sahaba, from the Prophet ﷺ, from the other Prophets of how to be a good Muslim man. It's entertaining, it's not too long, and I'm offering you the free first chapter. If you click the description below, then I will send that over to you. And then if you want to get the full book, you can get the full book. We also have the audio version. So check it out. So you're around. It's called The Shepherd's Way. Yeah, I think in, in my mind, like I definitely, when I left Nottingham, I was like, yeah, I'm going to go abroad. And so in my mind, I was like, yeah, I am going to leave and I'm going to make it, I'm going to go. Um, yeah. And so there was definitely a plan. But like I said, the plan was actually for Morocco, not yeah, Turkey. Yeah. But Qadr Allah, it, it fell into mm. Turkey. Mm. And when you were going to go to Morocco, was that going to be a long term thing or you're just going to travel around or what? No, when I moved to Morocco um, recently, like it was. No, no, I mean like. In your original plan like oh the original COVID. plan yeah yeah i think the original plan was like it was a lot of it was test and see like let's yeah. see how we get along but we knew just through the economics and other ways that um, living abroad could be really really good and lifestyle wise it could work really really well but there's always that kind of apprehension and i remember i recorded some like videos before just kind of vlogging my journey and i still had that apprehension about going abroad and what's it going to be like and will i be able to live there mm. and all of this kind of stuff um so i think in my mindset it, it was always about let's test it let's see how things go let's see how we feel and then after that we'll make a final decision mm. that's a really good like framework that i learned like quite a long time ago which is prototyping like whenever mm. possible whenever possible just do a test of something 
you know? Yeah. And alhamdulillah, I guess with the business, you know, that we had, like it's possible to do tests and stuff. When I came to Turkey, I think, bro, I had a, a plan which was, let me go for one month. If that's mm. good, I'll do three months. And if that's good, I'll do a year and then I'll, I'll see after that. Yeah. You know? But I think within like three weeks, I was like, I went straight to the year. I'll stay for a year. Exactly. Because um, yeah. it was easy to decide. And then what was your intention going then from Turkey to then Morocco, like where you live now? So, I mean, I don't know how we want to do this, bro, because I think this is a very sensitive topic. And I think when you put this video out, those people that watch this, they've got this mm. big thing around Turkey being better than Morocco and Morocco being better than Turkey and all this kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, like, I, I want to tell you a little bit about some of the things I loved about Turkey first, and then I'll tell you about, like, why why I was kind of considering moving and stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. Um, so for me... You want to like, really loved... do a sandwich, yeah? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> what, what, what I really loved about Turkey, right, um, is a lot of things that we miss in the UK. So, for example, fantastic weather, right? I found it really, really good. Uh, to do with the temperature, all that kind of stuff. The cost of living was amazing. Um, the fact that you're in a Muslim country, you get to hear the Adhan five times a day, all of this kind of stuff was really, really amazing. Like I said, I went in COVID time, so the opportunities that were available for me, whether it was cheap rents or hotels or whatever, that was really, really good. Um, I found like traveling, I did a lot of miles around Turkey. I drove a lot, alhamdulillah. I went to a lot of places um, and I just found it was so easy to travel in Turkey. Like I would just literally, me and my wife, we would get in a car, we would leave and we'd drive three, four hours. And on the way, we would book a hotel, right? And then we would just chill there for a day or two, then go to another place. And it was just amazing for, for being free, for traveling, for doing all this kind of stuff. Um, mm. And generally, the infrastructure was really good. So I come from Pakistan and, you know, the infrastructure there isn't great. But Turkey is, I would say, on par, if not better, than Western countries. So, for example, if you look at the roads in Turkey, they are better than the roads in London. Okay, the amount of potholes there are in London, and I don't want to rubbish my hometown because I still love the UK and stuff, but the potholes, whether it's the dirt, the rubbish, the cleanliness of Turkey, um, whether it's beautiful things like, um, you know, flowers and things at roundabouts and nicely cut grass and all these things, just I thought it was an amazing atmosphere to be in. I thought it was a really, really good place, very good value for money. Uh, and at the end of the day, there's blessings of, of being in an Islamic country, which I think are very, very uh, tangible and intangible as well. So overall, like I said, I really love Turkey. I love Bursa, where I live, which is just outside Istanbul. And all in all, I think it was a fantastic experience. Um, I think one of the things that you have to consider when you're making Hijra is about roots and going deeper and like long term seeing yourself in a place. Um, I think I could live in Turkey for sure for longer. Um, but whether that is the place to have long term roots and all this kind of stuff, I wasn't sure. And what I found is that obviously because we have family in Morocco, you can see yourself having deeper roots there. Also, my children being half Moroccan uh, or quarter Moroccan, you know, you have that, those roots there as well. Um, so for me, I was like, yeah, Morocco is a good option. It was always our first option. Um, also, I think there's some things uh, about Turkey, which uh, Morocco definitely beats. So infrastructure wise, I don't think Morocco um, is as good as Turkey. And we can go into some of those details as well. But generally, I found Turkey to still be quite Western. I found it to be quite secular, even in conservative areas like Bursa, where I lived. Uh, I felt it was very, con uh, very conservative in the Turk size, but it didn't have... Uh, it still had that secular Western kind of feel to it. So for example, um, practically like, you know, you would see alcohol shops everywhere. Like you could go in, you go to a shop and it's just full of alcohol, right? Um, and that is a bit of a culture shock because in Pakistan and things like that, we don't we don't have that. So I found that one of the things in, in my mind for Morocco wise was that Morocco from a dunya perspective, infrastructure wise was a little bit behind Turkey. But I found that from the whole, uh, the whole vibe being more Islamic, people being... Maybe um, maybe like uh, because of the Arabic, it feels like they're much closer to Islam. Um, I also found like, for example, in Turkey, like a lot of the masajid that I went to, it was usually just old men. Outside of Jummah, it was just old men. In, in Morocco, I see a lot of uh, young Muslims praying. I see Muslims praying on the street, reading Quran, all these kind of things that I didn't really see much of uh, in Turkey. So those are mm. some of the things I was thinking, I guess. So the intention moving to Morocco was to have more to live in a place where you have roots or your, your family has roots and maybe a bit more stability and stuff. And then also yeah. the, the more Islamic nature yani, of it. Yeah, it just, it just felt more Islamic, but also like, I think like, for example, the compound I live in now, there's a lady, she teaches Arabic there. Um, there's Hadith school, there's Arabic schools, there's all that kind of stuff. And at the end of the day, you're, you're kind of focused on learning Arabic as opposed to Turkish. 
Turkish was a bit of a mission as well, right? Um, and not that there's anything wrong with Turkish, but I just think that learning Arabic is like a is a bigger priority for me and my family, I guess. And I think that this kind of environment makes that much, much easier as well. Mm. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I think you, a lot, like I, I've observed a lot of people that move to different countries, whether when I was in UAE or when I'm here or, you know, I just hear from other people as well. And I think there's like moving countries when you've only ever lived in one, there's like levels to the game, you know, there's um, yeah. like experience does play a role. And I don't know, but it just sounds like you went through that learning curve where when you're in Turkey, uh, maybe, you know, you were, you were initially just checking it out and you were learning. And then over time, like you, you were there pretty much for three years in it or just less than yes. three years. Yeah. yeah. So over time, I guess you start to, you love it, you enjoy it. Um, you kind of, you get a bit comfortable and used to it. And then you start asking yourself the deeper questions, like you say, it? like the, the roots and the long-term thing yes. and what language would it make more sense to learn and all these kind of things and roots and family. So that's like part of the progress I see people make or the learning that they, they go through. Um, I see people as well, sometimes doing that with like, um, the Gulf in it, like they might go Saudi UAE, but after three years, they realize, oh, actually, mm. I, I want this. But sometimes you can only come to that conclusion after living and experiencing, like, swimming in that other place. Um, yeah. But I think whatever helps you take that leap, because it, it does feel like a leap, right? Whatever helps you take that leap to move to any other country um, is, is good, you know, even if eventually you're going to move from that initial stepping stone. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think there's something else to keep in mind. I think like moving is a very big thing. Um, mm. But I think you, you could imagine that when you have a decision, you're trying to make this decision and it's really, really like all the fears, the doubts, the negativity, the what ifs, they just fill your mind, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that when you actually make the move, it's like one of those things when you made the decision and you're like, why was I even thinking about this? Okay. Mm. Why was I even thinking about this? Because I was worried about this. I was worried about that. I was worried about all this kind of stuff, right? And I think we need to realize the time we live in, right? Like imagine if 20 years ago, I had decided, right, I want to make Hijra to uh, Turkey, okay? Like it would be a mission. It would be a real mission. Like 20 years ago, maybe like we had no YouTube. We had no Facebook. We had, like it's a very different world, right? So me trying to move to another country where I don't know the language and this, and this it's insane. But the blessings, alhamdulillah, that we have today, I think is so easy to move. It is so easy to move, right? Like literally, you can just pick any place in the world, book an Airbnb for a month, go there, start checking things out locally. You've got Google Translate. Um, the amount of reviews and things like that that are out there that will tell you about all the places. Google Maps will guide you everywhere. Renting a car online. Like the uh, facility that Allah has given us now, I think is insane to move and live where mm. we want. Mm. Right? So I think it's much, much easier um, to do it from an actual perspective of practically doing it. But it's just that getting over that hurdle. And I think the two things that have really kept people stuck, um, number one, I would say is money. So if you don't have money, I think it's very difficult to live in Turkey, Morocco, any of these places. You do not want to be earning money locally. Right. So I think money always restricts people. The second thing I think is schooling. So as soon as your kids are in school, you kind of feel like, well, if I take them out, it's going to disrupt them. It's going to do this. It's mm. going to do that. All of that kind of stuff. So these yeah. two things, they actually keep people stuck in their life in that way. Um, but if you're willing to kind of obviously have money outside of uh, your location and you're willing to do something different with the children, I think you can definitely get over that hurdle. Um, and then once you do it, like I said, like the lifestyle uh, I have now compared to the UK or I had in Turkey and all this kind of stuff, I think it was a much, much better lifestyle for me, for my wife, for my uh, kids and everything, right? And you kind of look at it all and you think this is so good compared to life in the UK. Now, the one downside, and I think this is what you need to think really deeply about, for me uh, was actually what everyone says as well is family. So family, mm -hmm. friends, community, the people that you uh, have spent your whole life with, being away from them, I think that's the hardest thing. And if it wasn't for that, I don't think there'll be so much uh, about the UK. 
so for me i still i still love london i still love going there i go there very very often my family's there all this kind of stuff but for me and others i think family is a massive thing now of course it does depend because there's some people bro they they grew up like maybe yourself or others they grew up in a country and in that country they had no cousins they had no family or uncles or aunties or anything right but for me where i grew up in london like in the uk i have hundreds of cousins and family members and we grew up together and every time there was a birth death marriage we were all together so for me there's a very heavy uh, absence when I, when I'm away from there but i think if you don't have that kind of uh, infrastructure and you just as your you know your family your brothers your sisters your mom dad you kind of grew up i think it's very easy to to move and settle uh, in a new place mm. and how how has having cuz your wife has some family in morocco right and in turkey you didn't have family so how has yeah. that helped you or has it helped you in living yeah, in so I think country. it's good. I mean, first of all, I'm not living too close to the in-laws. That's like uh, something that people laugh about. Um, mm. But I think I think we haven't seen the full of it yet. But like, obviously, when we go to Marrakesh, then there's family there. When we go to Casablanca, there's family there. Um, and like recently, one of my wife's uncles was ill, so we could go and visit. Um, and mm. just being around family, you know, I think it's really, really uh, important. Um, I don't have so much family here. and i think we don't have many young children as well but mm. just knowing that there's someone in there like allah forbid if something happened i'm not around you know like last year i flew a lot and i wasn't home so if something happens who who helps but when you mm. have family you know you got that thing in the back of your mind that there's someone there that can help and that can do mm. all those things so you didn't really uh, you weren't like asking them like oh how does this work in morocco how does that work not so much I actually had I actually had a, a really good friend here who who helped me answer a lot of questions and I think mm. there's a lot of good resources online so I always try and find people um before I go somewhere and try and speak to them try and get advice and guidance uh and and that's really really helped me a lot actually mm. Mm. okay and let's compare now just the everyday life okay average yeah. day average day in we could do like Turkey and like Bursa and and Tanja but like yeah. you could also add london in there if you want like what's the everyday like how how every day how does it differ the average day you know that's a good question i think that first thing i would say that the way it differs probably especially turkey and and uh, morocco is the temperature the temperature so the fact that alhamdulillah it's sunny almost every day right i think i think it's a very underrated thing the weather right and i'll tell you like when i first moved to morocco when i first came to morocco my intention was fully to move to uh to marrakesh uh because i was living uh, i wanted to be in a major city where you got access to things and all this stuff right um but when i went to marrakesh in the summer it was baking it was like 45 degrees bro okay yeah, and you know everyone does that whole thing of like oh it's like the uae where you just stay inside and i'm like no if you got to walk to the masjid or you got to go get a haircut during the day or do something it's still 45 degrees outside right and and then there was that whole mentality of oh maybe you can just you know go away for the summer and I was like being away for 3 4 months from your house not ideal as well so for mm-hmm. me i actually moved to tanger because of the temperature like the temperature here alhamdulillah is one of the best i've seen in the ho- in my whole life right um it's kind of mediterranean as well as like atlantic ocean and then at the same time it's basically um like most of the year is like very nice 20 25 degrees the whole year in the winter probably goes to about 10 12 degrees in the summer goes to like 30 35 um so for me temperature was a massive thing and this is one of the reasons i loved turkey because we were living now near a mountain we had really good weather in the winter it was skiing right there um in the summer it was just like beautiful views and all these kind of things so i think one of the most uh, underrated things about being abroad is actually the temperature the way uh, the the sun makes you feel all these things the vitamin uh, d or c which one it is d, yeah. and yeah and and like i i had a friend visiting um and every day he he was here he was here for a week now and he was just saying oh this view from from my window is amazing and the light and all this stuff and my brother every day he was here he would look at this window behind me and he just be like look at that blue skies blue skies blue skies right mm. so i think the weather um, itself makes a massive difference right even even if i go to the mosque early in the morning um you know it'll be like 16 17 degrees perfect i can just wear like a nice cloth just walk out no issues um so day to day i'll say weather makes a massive difference right um i think second thing is like peace of mind like One of the best things about being in a Muslim country is that you are a Muslim and you can be yourself and you don't have to worry about prejudice or any of this stuff or or feel like you're out of place or anything like this. So these kind of like intrinsic things I think that is really really uh, beneficial as well. Just again in in and I feel it more in Morocco by the way. 
like in in Turkey, um, this is weird. Like these are my only experiences. I don't want anyone to take this like as a general thing. But I remember when I first arrived in Turkey, I, I was like getting in a lot of arguments. And I wasn't doing anything wrong. People were just aggressive towards me. And I realized that a lot of it was to do with me just wearing a felt. Like different situations I was getting into. <laughs> and it got to a point where I, was, I wasn't very comfortable wearing a felt because I was like, every time I do this, they think, uh, you know, I'm a scam or I'm this, I'm that. I don't know. I don't know why. It was just like kind of weird like that, right? Um, mm. So I feel Morocco's even more like you can just be Islamic. You can be yourself. Um, and I think both countries, they respect this. Like, you know, if I get stopped by the police in Morocco, like they respect that I'm uh, a Muslim, practicing Muslim, I have a beard, all this kind of stuff, right? In the UK, when you get stopped by the police, it's not really like that, right? Mm. It might it might be the opposite. So I think there's a lot of benefits that uh, of being in these countries that you don't realize. For example, hearing the adhan, right? Like a lot of the time, my, my, my daughter, I'm like, when we're in London especially, I'm like, did you pray? She said, no, I, no, I didn't know when the time was. And, and over here, you hear the adhan. Right, I didn't hear the adhan. I didn't pray. So it's like if you hear the adhan, you know uh, you got to pray. So I think there's a lot of benefits that come to do with your inner peace, with your contentment, with all the, these kind of things uh, that are there. Day to day, I don't feel like there's a massive difference. I think that um, I'm, I'm located better here, so maybe I, I can walk to the masjid, which is really really nice. Um, and you know, just just being around in your day to day things, I think things are a bit cheaper as well. So mentally. When you're going through things, it's like very, very easy. So rather than me thinking, oh my God, if I get up today and take the kids out, we're going to spend 60, 70 quid and this and that. You just think, oh, I can just step out. I can go here. I can do this. Um, and it's just a much cheaper way of life and all of these kind of things. But day to day, you know, I'm still kind of like just working on, on my laptop, doing all those kind of things. Um, I don't think there's a massive, mm. massive day to day difference mm. in, in that. Sense. Would you agree that um, within the four walls of your house, whether you're in London, Morocco, Turkey, it's going to be pretty similar. As 2025 rolls in, a lot of us think about what we accomplished in the year before, 2024. What was it for you? Did you do what you wanted to do? Did you even know and have a clear plan of what you wanted to do? Well, let's make the next few months and the next year completely different with a free, full guide on how to crush your goals. What this does, it helps you beat procrastination. It helps you beat not having clear direction and clarity in what you want to do. It helps you beat the doubts and the self-talk that pushes you away from accomplishing what you really want. And it helps you with distractions as well. It's a complete guide end to end. I didn't really take anything out of that that you would need. So go grab it now by clicking the link in the description. As 2025 rolls in, a lot of us reflect on that milestone of what we've actually accomplished in the last year. And a lot of us will be happy with a few things we've done, but we always know we could have done more, or some of us really feel like we've done nothing and it's just been a failure of a year. So now's a chance to reset and rethink and lock in and think, what do I want to achieve in the next year? And how will I do that? And for that, I've got the perfect thing, a complete guide on crushing your goals in 2025. It helps you with procrastination that a lot of people face. It helps you with negative self-talk and it helps with distractions that come along the way. And these are things that are stopping you. They're the barrier, a solid iron wall in the way of accomplishing your big goals, like starting that business, getting that promotion, getting married, whatever it is for you. So go and download it right now. It takes you full step by step through exactly what you need to accomplish your goals this year. Right. Yeah, that, that's what I feel. Apart from the weather, like I said, I think yeah. generally like it, it will be quite similar. But I think yeah. it's the day-to-day -day interactions and it's knowing the environment that you're in that's going to make a difference as well. So I feel, yeah. like, um, I feel like the UK, for example, has a lot of stress. Okay, mm. I feel just generally there, there is a lot of stress. And mm -hmm. I, I remember I got, I got stopped in, uh, my, my brother, he, he sent me this page, someone using the card, we don't know who it was, out of the family. They, they basically got caught speeding 33 or 37 or something in a 30 something miles per hour, right? Mm. So when a letter like that comes in, bro, in the UK, like there's nothing but stress because you think, oh my God, like who was driving? And if it's me, is it going to be points? And if I have points, are my insurance going to go up? Am I going to be able to get insurance? And what about the penalty points? And what if I get another speeding fine? Am I going to, you know, think about that stress from that one letter. Okay, mm. and here, yeah. like I was in Morocco <laughs> last year when I was visiting, and I was driving down this road, and I feel like it was a speed trap. The road was like, um, like it was like eighty the whole way, and then there was one sign when it's going downhill saying fifty. 
okay? But <laughs> either side, it said like 80 or whatever. And right there, yeah. the police are sitting there, right? So they stopped me, they pulled me over. And I'm kind of upset. I'm like, what the hell? It, I said to them, you're saying it's 50. Over there, there's a sign saying 80. Over there, there's a sign saying 80. Where is it 50? He's like, no, if you drive back up, coming down the hill is 50. I'm like, that's why you guys are parked here, right? So anyway, I was going back and forth with him. I was I made a, one of those tourist social media videos, which he later got me to uh, remove and delete and stuff, right? Um, but when I got talking to him, I'm like, how much is the fine? And he said, 150 dirhams. Mm. And I was like, 12 pounds. I was like, mm. okay, no problem. Let's, let's do this, you know? <laughs> I, was, I was like, yeah. fine with it. Because it's like, you're paying 12 pounds, and there's no other points. There's no this insurance, nothing. It's just, you just pay twelve pound and you're gone, you know. Yeah. And and so generally, I feel like I'm much more relaxed in these countries. Um, it might be because people are a bit more uh, human. Maybe they're a bit more relaxed and these kind of things. I think there's things I would do in in Morocco and Turkey that I wouldn't do in the UK. Like in the UK, for example, there's a road where we used to live where if you take a right turn, there's basically um, you get camera and you get fine. Okay, and this is a right turn that has existed for the last 40 years since I've been alive. But they put this thing in place, you can't turn right. Um, another road, there's a road where basically there's a school, so you can't enter that road at school times. And there's just a little sign on the side. So if I drive mm. in there, I'm basically going to get fined. You know, mm. so these kind of like things, you don't think about them, but I feel like there's a lot less stress and there's a lot less pressure mm. when you're outside of uh, the UK and the West. So is that though because you can just afford more stuff easily in Morocco, for example? Or is it just there's more rules and things to worry about that you're breaking or not breaking? I think the Western world has a lot more rules. And of course, rules are good on, on the sense that they bring about stability and, and all those kind of things. But I think the amount of rules, the amount of uh, kind of things that are there, they really mm. get to the point where it feels really, really uh, restrictive. Mm. You know, yeah. uh, Morocco has rules. Like you remember, I mean, when we were in Tangier and we saw my car being towed away. Right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. It was, why was it towed away? It was parked the, the wrong way. So the road goes that way. I park my car this way. Obviously, in England, you park whichever way. And they towed it away because of that. Right? Yeah. So for me, that's like a silly rule. That's kind of like a, like a lot and stuff. But yeah. at the same time, I think the, the pressure and all that stuff uh, is definitely like worse in, in, in Western countries. Mm. Okay. And then what about the interaction, your day to day interactions with people? you know, in the shops with the one, yeah. maybe the police or this whatever. This is good. Like in, in Turkey, generally, I found people to be very friendly. I found people to be really good. Uh, I have, I think there's a big difference between the places that you live in. Okay. Yeah. So I know a lot of people who come to, who came to Istanbul, for example, one of my uh, good friends, he told me about how he came to Istanbul. He had a terrible time. He was just like, he was just pestered all the time and all that kind of stuff. Right. But when yeah. you live in a place, um, which is, like, for example, Bursa, Tanjir, all these kind of places, it's very different to the normal tourist experience, okay? So, for example, you could go to places in Turkey where, or, or, or even Morocco where they're heavily uh, visited by tourists, and so everyone there is just trying to make money off you, and they have this kind of intention to just get money and use you and all this kind of stuff, okay? Um, but when you go to the normal places where people live, it's not actually like that. This is normal Muslims living their own lives, just want to get on with things, all this kind of stuff. Generally very friendly, very helpful. Um, in Turkey, language is a big, big issue, I think. There was very, very few people, especially in Bursa, who spoke English. Um, unless they were in some kind of like trade to do with tourism, they didn't speak English. And I'm saying to the point where I would say no, and they still would not have a clue of what I'm saying, right? <laughs> um, so generally, like, I, I think like you just pick up the language, you just speak to kind of people. But I think my my general interactions were good. They were very nice with people, got into conversations mm. when they could speak English. Um, I tried a bit of Turkish here and there, um, but it was very, very uh, limited. I think most of my kind of interactions were with friends and most of my friends were basically expats uh, who were from either like Canada or UK or something like that. Uh, and mm -hmm. it was just friends that I hung out with who, who were from abroad, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. That was the situation there. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's very, it's been a very similar experience in, in Morocco um, where, especially where I'm living in Tanger, there's not many um, people. So this was my friend who came here this, this week, he was saying it's, it's so calm here. Like in Tanger, it's so calm and it's so relaxed compared to like Marrakesh or Casablanca and all of that. Um, and this is, again, one of the reasons why I did it. But he also said to me, he goes like, people just get on with their lives here. They're not like really interested in badgering you or pestering you or anything like that. Um, so if you stop, if you ask someone, they're very helpful. They speak to you nicely. Um, it's been a really good experience. And I found the people in Morocco to be like really, really friendly and everything's been mm. really good. So 
but but give me give me a comparison with between in Turkey and in Morocco you, because the way you describe it now it's like it's pretty much the same is yeah. that really what you think or I think well definitely like I said I feel that Morocco does have that uh, it feels more Islamic, it feels less secular, it feels less Western. And I think that reflects on the people as well. So, for example, like, um, you know, just just in, in talking to people and stuff, um, I don't know, they just feel like they're probably a bit more connected to Allah. And this is a very big generalization in that sense, right? Um, but I don't know, I think because it, they feel less secular and more Arab, it feels like uh, maybe more more common to me or more thing but mm. like i said i don't have this thing where like one of my friends he came and he, he's actually a, a a a british black person who lived in pakistan for a little while and he said to me i love the pakistanis they were so friendly this that and the other and he said to me i feel like the turks are cold mm -hmm. okay i feel like the turks are cold and i said to him that part of this is actually the language barrier like if you can't understand what someone says then then they feel cold Right, but if you can communicate with them, then you can actually connect with them, and you feel warmer and stuff. So for me, I didn't feel like oh, the Turkish people are really bad, or they're really cold, or or they're all this kind of stuff. Right? I didn't I didn't feel any of that. I f I felt like they were just nice, normal mm. kind of people. But maybe, like I said, because of the language, Arabic, all this kind of stuff, and and everything to do, like things, even like things mm. like Jazakallah Khair, all this kind of stuff. I think uh, obviously the Moroccans will say all these kind of things, which which the Turks wouldn't. Um, and yeah. then I think in Turkey, sometimes in the back of your mind, you've got this thing where, like, because Turkey's split very evenly with secular and, and, and religious people, right? And so in your mind, sometimes you've got this thing, like, is this a secular person who just really doesn't <laughs> like Islam? And if that's a, if this is a secular person that doesn't like Islam and he sees me, who he thinks is like a, like a proper mm. practicing Muslim, whatever, like, what impact is that having on me? Right. So maybe it's like my own kind of uh, perceptions of, of secular and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but mm. again, like I said, if, if the people in, in Turkey were horrible, I didn't like it, this and that, um, I would just say it and I wouldn't want to really live there. Um, I think yeah. racism and all this kind of stuff was on the rise. And we saw a lot of incidents in Turkey against Syrians and all these kind of things. Um, but me, myself, I've never faced anything like overtly uh, racist or anything uh, negative like that. Mm. Really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, both both countries like people treated you well um yeah, yeah people are good generous nice it's just yeah. in morocco maybe a bit more english a bit more islamic vibe a bit more using islamic terms in you know less secular yeah. like like i said alcohol bro like i, I haven't seen uh, like an alcohol shop here in morocco since i've been here right mm, but yeah. in turkey you would see that i think for example um the way women dress Right. Of course, mm. Marrakesh might be a bit different, but generally, um, I think that the Turkish women dress in a very Western way. Mm. Um, and I think that uh, in Morocco, like it's not like that. Right. So you'll find like the majority of women will wear hijab. And um, I, I feel like the dress sense is very, very different and things like that as well. So I think mm -hmm. apparent stuff on the street and all this kind of sometimes you can be in Turkey and you just feel like you just you're just in London somewhere. Right. It, mm. it doesn't feel like you're in a Muslim country or something like that. So, mm. yeah. yeah. And OK, what about the kind of convenience factor uh, in Turkey or in Morocco? Like, how is it different? I know, you know, I consider Turkey extremely convenient, extremely well run and stuff. Yeah. And uh, people know from listening to the podcast what I think about Algeria. Yeah. Uh, which is a bit different. So what about Morocco? How do you find, how do you compare the two with that? Stuff. So I think I think Morocco is behind Turkey, like I keep saying, and I feel like they're catching up very fast. Okay, and I want to give you some practical things and impractical things as well, right? So, for example, in Turkey, um, there were a lot of stuff, there were a lot of things that were open to my kids and family just because we were residents in that country. So, for example, my daughter, she used to go gymnastics. Okay, we would pay like a hundred uh, lira. I think at the time it was like six pound for a month. Okay, and she would go to gymnastics uh, once or twice a week, whatever it was. And in that same place, they had a chess club, they had taekwondo, they had, they had all this stuff available uh, mm -hmm. at a very, very reasonable price. The universities, all these kind of things, people come from abroad to learn uh, there and everything. The infrastructure, all that stuff is really, really good, right? I haven't found um, Morocco to be exactly like that in terms of those kind of things. But I, I want to give you a practical example uh, of the mm -hmm. difference. Um, just before I do that, I want to tell you some little things which I found uh, when I was kind of researching, 
But then everyone else was like, bro, maybe you're just too much of a wimp and you're too much of a city boy, right? <laughs> so, for example, I, I, one of the things I found is that Google Maps wasn't great in Morocco compared to Turkey. So I was on the motorway, I was driving, and I was looking for a petrol station because I was running out of fuel. And when I looked on Google Maps, it was saying there's no petrol station for like 60 miles. Okay, so I'm worried now driving, stressing like, is there a petrol station? And there was loads of petrol stations on the way. They just weren't on Google Maps. And, yeah. and then the ways that you go and stuff. Whereas Turkey was very, very accurate. Okay, so that's mm. one digital thing. Second digital thing is uh, when I got here, there was no YouTube premium. So again, someone's saying, yo, what's bro? What, what does that make a difference to your hijra or whatever? It doesn't. It's just little minor things, right? Um, so YouTube premium, they didn't have. So everything is like ads-based when you're watching YouTube and all this kind of stuff, right? Um, third, third thing was that was yeah apple pay so there was there was no apple pay okay so the, these things for me like they're small things but when you have lots of small things they kind of add up especially for infrastructure now this is what i'm saying about morocco actually catching up that last year morocco was one of the 10 countries that actually in africa was allowed to have youtube premium so now there's youtube premium in morocco okay yeah. um last year they started apple pay so now apple pay is very normal so this was one of the downsides of turkey uh, sorry morocco was that morocco is a much more of a cash society than turkey okay turkey bro this place that i went to turkey in the middle of nowhere tourist place the lady she was selling something i said i don't have anything she said no problem give me iban and mm. and i got my kuvet turk thing out and i transferred her the money like in an mm. IBAN account, and, and I bought goods from her. Whereas Morocco mm. is like, get cash out. Everything, get cash, mm. get cash, get cash, right? And yeah. I hated that whole uh, element of like cash society. I prefer the card, it's so convenient. So I basically um, just use my card everywhere. But now I've found since Apple Pay come and all this kind of stuff. So I'm saying it's catching up very fast. And then the last mm. example I want to give you regarding infrastructure and all this kind of stuff um, is the bank, okay? So when I went to open my bank in Morocco, this is what happened, right? I went to the bank. Uh, they opened at nine thirty. I went there. Uh, I went to the bank and I uh, basically queued up. And they said, uh, "You want to open an account?" I said, "Yes." They said, "Okay." The manager is not here right now. Okay, so please come back like after twelve or something, All right? Or mm -hmm. tomorrow at twelve or whatever. Mm -hmm. so I'm like, "Okay, cool." One visit. I go there the second time, and then um, I go there around twelve, and he goes, "Oh, the manager's not in again today." Mm -hmm. Right. And then it's like, okay, I'm like, look, bro, do something for me. He's like, okay, let me let me do this, let me do that for you. Come in again. So then I come back a, a third time. I remember when I got to the bank, I, I think I went there at 9.30. The opening time was 9.30. Mm. 9.30, no one there, just a queue. 9.35, no one. 9.40, no one. 9.45, someone strolling in slowly, opening up, taking their time, you know, that kind of thing, right? And mm -hmm. then I've gone there, when, when I've opened my account, then they said, for the card, you have to come back again. Okay, mm. so this is my experience with opening a bank account in uh, Morocco, mm. right? In and all Turkey, that was in English. This, this, yeah, the guy at Hamza, he spoke English, so it was very good. First time around, mm. I took my friend with me, but he spoke English, so I said I'll deal with it myself. Mm. In uh, in Turkey, this was the thing. Like once I had my paperwork and stuff, I went to there to the bank and I said I want to open an account. They said okay, sit here. They gave me a ticket and then they said go and sit in that room. I went into the room. There was nobody in the room. Okay, yeah. I went there, I sat there, and there's a camera and a screen in front of me and this scanner and everything, right? And suddenly this lady pops up. <laughs> yeah. the bank, right? Mm. And she's sitting somewhere in Istanbul, I'm in Bursa, and she goes, hello, sir, welcome to Kuvet Turk, this, that, you want to open an account? Yes. Okay, sir, please put your passport in here, scan it, please do this, please do this. Okay, sir, your account is now opened. I was like, yeah. what? Okay, cool. What about my card? Yes, sir, please collect the card from the desk before you leave. No, what? Even in England, I don't, I don't collect my card before I leave. What do yeah, you mean, yeah. right? So I go yeah. there, they give me a card. They said, go to that cash point, type in your PIN, do it all. Bro, yeah. I walked out of there with a brand new bank account and with my card. Yeah. Right? And so and this, they have I, agents, I, like, whatever language you want, you just pick yeah. that and they have an agent that speaks yeah. that. But, that but this is what I'm saying to you about the infrastructure differences, right? Of course, yeah, yeah. the roads are better in Turkey and because they have so much tourism, they've got, most, like, big motorways and all that kind of stuff. But I'm saying there's different little things like this, which is yeah. very famous with, like, Asian, Pakistani, Middle East kind of culture where it just gets longed out and there's no proper processes and all these kind of things. And I feel like Turkey is, like, really, really way ahead uh, in those yeah. kind of things and the conveniences and things that uh, come with yeah. it, you know? Yeah. And how much, this is what someone would be thinking, and I asked myself this as, as well, probably you were asking yourself when you were going to move Morocco, is does that stuff really matter? Like, is that, you know, worth worrying about and thinking and analyzing? 
Yeah. I think I think that if it's like stuff that you have to go through headaches one time, yeah. I don't think it's uh, an issue. So let's say that opening a bank account is much more painful in Morocco, right? Yeah. The truth is you're only going to have to do that once or twice. Okay. Yeah. Same with connecting the electricity, same with doing this or that. Like you're going to have to do it one. It might take you double the time, triple the time, all that kind of stuff. So if it's like things that you just have to do one off setup and it's long, then I wouldn't worry too much about it. Okay. Yeah. But if it's something that's going to interact all the time and it's going to affect you on a daily basis and all these kind of issues that come with it, then I would say it could be a, a deal breaker in that sense, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm always thinking about this with Algeria because although a lot of the things are small, it does add up to being every day, right? Yeah, yeah. So like if getting a taxi is long, opening a bank account is long, paying a bill is long. Now the, this starts to become every day, every couple of yeah. days or whatever, you know? So yeah, I don't know. Um, and then what about when it comes to like opportunities for um, either dawah or ibadah in general or um, seeking knowledge? How does that differ? So I think I think this is one of the things I would say is like, unfortunately, this is where the West wins, I feel, right? There's, there's not many places the West wins. Um, like one of my friend, he was saying, is there many parks in Tanger? I'm like, there's parks, but not what you're used to in the UK and stuff. So parks are really good in the UK, I feel, right? Um, and I feel like Dawa and impact work and all this kind of stuff, I think it's like the best is in the West, right? Because... I think there's very serious limitations on what you can do in different countries. I think Turkey was uh, a lot more open than Morocco. I, I know there's different groups and different things operating there. Uh, and from a Dawa perspective, I know that even in uh, some of the big Masajid, they were allowing Dawa and all that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think Morocco's a little bit different. And I think generally in Muslim countries, there's a lot more control over what you can do, what you can't do, teaching this, that, all these kind of uh, things. And I think this is where the West has a lot of freedom. Uh, and I think it's it's a lot better to kind of do that. At the same time, I do feel that there's real opportunities for Dawah. So people come to Morocco, come to Turkey, and they really enjoy it. Um, and, and that has a positive impact on them. And they meet Muslims and they interact with them and they feel like they're really amazing. And so one of the things I've actually been thinking about recently is that I should do something in Tanger to do with Dawah. Like I would love to just like either meet non-Muslims or speak to non-Muslims and tell them about Islam. So I think there's a massive opportunity, but I think you have to be very careful uh, in the way that you operate in these things. Mm. So there's more restrictions. Um, yeah. Yeah. In the Arab world in general. Um, what about, because I know there are a lot of mashaykh in, in Morocco. Yeah. Do you know about any of those like locally or maybe is it a language barrier thing or? Yeah, I don't know so much about them, but I've seen on different groups um, that there are a lot of scholars all around Morocco uh, and even mm. in Tanger there's a lot. So I think what I need to do is really lock down my Arabic first um, and yeah. then you can start getting into all of these kind of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because we're on this topic, one thing I would say is that um, for me, in my personal experience, I found Turkey to be um, very, very disappointing uh, from a Ramadan perspective. Okay, So for me, I felt like Ramadan was a very tough time in Turkey. Okay, like the fasting, all that kind of stuff was okay. Um, but I felt like there was a lot of people in Turkey, and again, the whole secular nature of it, where it was Ramadan and people just eating and drinking on the streets. I'm talking about men, like, there's no excuse. Like, okay, some of them might be sick, but like, just everyday people, a they're lot all of traveling, them, bro. They're all traveling. Sorry, that's why I <laughs> forgot, right? And, and they were just like eating and drinking. So, from, from a perspective of like fasting, I don't know if many people. No, many people was wrong, but there was there was a lot of people I saw who who weren't fasting, okay, um, and and I felt that was kind of like strange because a lot of Muslims, even if they're non-practicing, they will fast, right? Um, so yeah. I found it strange, and then I think the other thing that disappointed me was actually uh, Tarawih and going for prayers and stuff like that. My local masjid, they, they literally, bro, they were they were on like 110 miles per hour, right? Literally, they would read like two three ayahs and they would they would be done. Right. And my son, like he was loving it. He was like, this is amazing. I'm like, no, this is not how Tarawi is supposed <laughs> mm. to be. Right. It's not like this. Um, mm. So I felt I felt like it was very, very um, different. I felt like Ramadan in the UK is amazing. I feel like the buzz, the different massages that you go to, the people, everyone fasting, everyone. I feel like the UK is an amazing place to be in Ramadan. And for me, I was like, you can't beat the UK. Right? Obviously, there's Makkah Medina where you work very hard and it's amazing. But I felt like the UK is an amazing place to be for Ramadan. Um, in Morocco, I found it different. 
in Morocco, I found it different to Turkey, right? It was much more the kind of vibe that I was expecting. Right. Um, so, for example, the massage is full, you know, children going to the mosque, all this kind of stuff. Of course, you get that in, in Turkey, but I'm saying for like all the prayers, you see young people going to the masjid, all this kind of stuff. Um, I remember I was in uh, I was at a restaurant for Iftari in, in the center of Tanger. This road, which is always busy, it's always packed. It was dead at Iftari time. Bro. It was completely empty. Right. Because everyone is actually fasting and the whole culture is around that. Even the, there's a law that you can't actually um, have a restaurant or open or sell food uh, in Ramadan here. And so everything is a, is like really focused on the fasting, on Ramadan, on Tarawih, um, you know, all these kind of things. Even even with Eid, like, you know, getting my own animal, going to the farm, picking the animal, transporting the animal, bringing it, getting it, all this kind of stuff. Um, very, very different, you know. So mm. I felt like Ramadan and, and this kind of spiritual nature, I found it to be much stronger. And this way, like, you know, when we had the discussions, I was, I was talking to you about, Turkey, Morocco, I was saying to you, like, I feel like the dunya is much better in Turkey, but I think the the deen and the akhira will be much better served in Morocco. Like, for me personally, that's mm. how I felt. And I think that when you look at things like, um, you know, uh, Ramadan, all this kind of stuff, I think it really, really showed me um, that it was better. Now, of course, there are differences. For example, like my quality of life, I think, especially for the kids, is better here because here I'm living in a compound. The kids can go out themselves. Alhamdulillah, they can go out safely, come back in. The masjid is very close. I can actually walk to the masjid, whereas I used to drive. So I think there's other elements where I've set up my life to be better and easier in Morocco uh, than Turkey, and that's probably made a difference as well. What do you think? How how different would it be if, you know, let's say you were on much more of a budget in Morocco, how would your life yeah. be different? Like, how much of a budget? Because I think there's levels. Uh, I mean, it's hard for me to say, but let's say if you had, I don't know, 1,200 pounds, like you could survive yeah. on that. I don't know how much more you could do on that. Yeah, I think my lifestyle would be very different. I think what it is is that, first of all, Turkey was really cheap. Turkey used to be amazing price-wise, okay? Yeah. The best, I would say. Um, mm. But over the last couple of years, when inflation's happened and the lira and all this kind of stuff, it's become very, very expensive <laughs> to the point where maybe it's more expensive than Morocco now. Right, um, Turkey is very good. They produce a lot of their in-house in stuff in their own country, whether it's fruits, vegetables, uh, fridges, and, and equipment and stuff. So generally, they're really good like that. Um, but I think like what you'll find in Morocco and a, a lot of places is that you can still find a two-bed flat for like two, three hundred pounds. Okay, and then if you eat mostly vegetable, all this kind of stuff, I think you can a family can survive on twelve hundred, but I think it will be very tight. Okay. Mm. Now, if you want a different place, for example, my compound that I live in, I could find um, I could find a place outside this compound, which is probably bigger than mine, um, for hundreds of pounds cheaper per month. Okay. Mm -hmm. But because it's in the compound, because of security, because of like it's kind of like known and stuff, it, it it costs more. So, but I think if you're not into all those things and you're not like I don't have to be in a compound and all, I think you can definitely find stuff. I think mm. it's still viable and i think when you think about life in the uk so for example in london um if you were to rent a two-bed flat how much does it cost it costs two thousand pounds minimum okay yeah. then if you've got to pay council tax 200 pounds you've got to pay bills before you've done anything you're on 3k right maybe with a little bit of food so i'm saying if you go to morocco turkey any of these countries 3k you live like a king like in in turkey like I, my kids were going horse riding they would go ice skating uh, i was going shooting uh, all the time all this kind of stuff, and still the costs weren't that high, you know. Um, so yeah, I think it's definitely viable, even if you're on a budget mm. as well. But does that mean Moroccans are earning twelve hundred pounds or more? No, no, no. Moroccans are, are not living like that at all, right? Um, I think mm. one of the things we're going to realize is that um, a lot of like the normal wage probably be about four hundred pounds here or something. Okay. Okay. Um, but when like remember they're living here for for centuries or thousands of years. So when you have your own house and you don't have a car or you have your car already then you can actually live on a very uh, small amount. Maybe you could live on like three, four, five hundred pounds, right? Um, so definitely it's viable for you to live. But it's the kind of place here where you can rent an apartment here for 200 pound or 2,000 pound, okay? You can eat a meal here for one pound or for 100 pound. Is is that kind of place where it's all down to mm -hmm. you. Like for example, five-star hotels here, there's not many uh, in Tanger. And what I found is the prices are ridiculous. I'm talking like, it's like a thousand pound a night. Okay. Even in England, you could go to some of the best hotels in London, three, four, five, six hundred pounds. Okay. So it's that whole kind of thing where really, really poor people live in these countries 
Mm. But if you have money, then of course you can live a very different lifestyle as well. What would you be sacrificing if you were living on like six hundred pounds? Would the housing be like awful, or would it? Yeah, I think I think I mean it wouldn't be awful, but I think maybe the area wouldn't be that great. Um, but again, generally Morocco is a very safe country, so I think you would be sacrificing probably the area that you live in. It would be a much smaller place um, mm. that you live in as well. I think we would definitely not be eating out uh, at all or hardly ever, kind of thing. Um, mm. And then we would just be a bit careful, I think, when it comes to other things like electricity and what you're using and all of these kind of things. You know. Mm, mm. Right. Okay. It's good. I don't know. I like that peace of mind that if I had to, I could live on 500 pounds, you know, but in yeah. some countries it's just completely impossible. Um, yeah. What surprised you the most about Morocco so far? What surprised me about Morocco? Do you mean this time around, like, like living here? Yeah. Since living there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think a huge amount has surprised me. And the reason is because I visited here a few times. Um, mm. I don't feel like there's anything that's kind of like come out of the blue and all of this kind of stuff. I think the infrastructure stuff did surprise me a little bit where I was kind of like, like this looks good and I thought it would be good. But then at the same time, like it does seem like that very Arab kind of mentality come tomorrow. I'm not there, this and that. Cause from the outside, it looks like everything works well. And then mm. when you see the nice roads and the good internet and all this kind of stuff, but I think uh, at the heart of it, you realize that deeper down, there's not mm. that that infrastructure and that solidity and and those processes in place to do things sure. really efficiently. Yeah, actually, a lot of countries I've seen, you know, in Africa in general, um, they would build something. It's brand new, of course. When they build it brand new, it looks sick. But if you yeah. have the systems in pro pl place for maintenance. Uh, or like you cut corners when you're building it. So yes. although you cut corners, it could look good, but it's not yeah. going to stay like that very long. Yeah. And that's why I noticed a lot in Algeria that the maintenance processes maybe don't exist. And then th there must be corners cut or materials yeah. used are not that, um, don't last long, basically. So within two years, the brand new fancy building looks terrible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I think, I think this is one of the difference actually about Turks as well. I felt like the Turks were very by the book. Yeah. Okay. You know, like when they say no, Olmaz, like it's not happening. It's impossible now. Yeah. And they're just like very by the book. Um, and I and I and I think that is very good for when you're doing processes and systems and setting things up and all that kind of stuff. So because of yeah. that, I think they've got a really, really good kind of education system. Like, think about it, bro. Like they're building warships. Mm. They're building warships. You, you know what it takes to actually build a warship and to have an industry that produces mm. warship. It, it's insane, bro. Like it's a very tough thing to do, yeah. right? But they have that foundation, I think, in their education. And the Turkish schools generally, the, the the actual public schools are better than the private schools. And their infrastructure and their learning and education, all that stuff is really, really amazing. And that's why they've got that kind of Western by the book kind of mentality. Whereas in Morocco, it's like a lot more like relaxed and yeah, we'll do it tomorrow. Yeah. And, and I think that shows up in the people as well, because I feel like you might find that Moroccan people are a bit more kind of like relaxed, right? Mm -hmm. Um and even, even times when I got stopped by police, they just kind of talked to me and they just kind of like let me go and all this kind of stuff. So I, I feel like uh, like maybe like there's pros and cons to it, but it is a bit of a different culture. Yeah. It's, it's a hard line to tread because sometimes, like when it comes to, I don't know, maintenance of the roads, you benefit and you enjoy yeah. the fact that yeah. they're by the book. But then when the police stop you, you like don't want them to be by the book. Yeah. <laughs> So like, I, I, don't, I don't know if this yeah. is true, but one of my friends said to me, he said, there aren't many problems that 200 dirhams can't sort out with the mm. police. Okay? Yeah. Obviously, I wouldn't want to bribe or tell anyone to bribe, but that is the culture uh, in certain places where if you have some money, it actually resolves a lot of the issues, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of weird. One thing I do want to say, I mean, because there's always this kind of discussion about which one's better, Turkey, which one's Mor Morocco, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, a really important point I want to make is I think the area that you live in makes a massive difference. Okay. Yeah. So I can tell you there are places right now in Turkey, which are much better to live in than Morocco. Okay. So for example, Bashakshir, I found that Bashakshir was an amazing place to live compared to a lot of parts in Morocco. Mm -hmm. Okay. But in the same way, I feel there are amazing places in Morocco which are better than places in Turkey. So I think the city you choose and the area you live in, it makes a massive difference to, to all of your life.
Okay. Yeah. And in addition, I would go as to far as far as to say the same for the UK. So I'm not like I've got no qualifications religiously to say uh, it's haram this that. I'm saying if you consider it okay to be in the UK or living in the UK, you might find that there are places and areas in the UK which are better for you to live than living abroad. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Like, imagine I'm a Pakistani or an Indian who grew up in Blackburn, which is filled with Pakistanis, Muslims, Indians. And in my locality, it's all just Muslims. And we grew up with Muslims and there's a mosque on every corner. And it's just it's just that kind of vibe. And then we've got really good Islamic schools like they've got in Blackburn and, and all this kind of stuff. Okay, I've got a community. I've got this. I've got that. My kids are growing up with family and etiquette and all this stuff, right? Is it better for me to live in that environment then move to somewhere where I have no people, I don't know the language, I don't have any community, my kids are not growing up with family anymore, there's no more of that stuff, and now I'm living in a community, in a country where I don't know anyone, and I'm living in this city which is not as religious as actually the area that I lived in, and it's very different, and which one's better for me? I don't know, but I would say that the area, the city that you live in, I think it makes a massive difference. Now, of course, I think that there's so much barakah and blessings from being in a Muslim country, um, but I'm just saying that I think everyone needs to look at their own circumstances and they need to kind of, you know, judge accordingly on that. Yeah, 100%. I was just speaking to someone who, he's in Turkey now, but he's, his job is in Saudi and he was living in Saudi, but he was in Riyadh and he's like, I hate Riyadh, it's so busy, yeah. it's all this and that. And he's like, so I might move back to Saudi, but it would have to be um, elsewhere. And Medina is obviously number one. Medina is like, you know, everyone says Medina, amazing, this and yeah. that. And yeah. Riyadh is kind of like, you know, much busier and much more, you could say, capitalistic and just like, you know, that more of that big city vibe, I suppose, that's yes. a bit more stressful and stuff. So, yeah, every country is like that. Um, even, what was it, um, Malaysia, right? Malaysia, you've got KLCC, which is like where you might go as a tourist. That's where I mm -hmm. went as a tourist. And then there are the suburbs of Kuala Lumpur, which are way more, you know, conservative, way more Malay people rather than you know the chinese or the indian whatever and uh, just a completely different feeling you know so I've, i haven't actually been there but um you know it's it's the same everywhere basically what you're saying that i think the I think neighborhood I had a big shift, the city makes a difference yeah i was gonna say i had a big shift from being a londoner okay mm. to not being a londoner in my life yeah Right. Yeah. And I feel like like people would come to London. I was like a big advocate of London. I used to say London is the greatest city on earth after Makkah and Medina. Probably just because I had to Islamically, right? <laughs> but I was like, it's like great. I was like the biggest advocate of London. And people would come, mostly northerners, right? And they would whine about the traffic and the tight roads and all this kind of stuff, right? And I was like, what's wrong with these guys? Why are they hating? They always come and say negative stuff about here and there, right? Mm. And then I moved to Nottingham. And Nottingham's like a much smaller city. It's like completely different to London in that sense. And then when I went back to London, I saw it all. It's like my eyes opened. Right? <laughs> I, I saw what they were talking about, like the traffic and this. And I was like, oh my God, like I was in it. I couldn't see it. Right. Mm. And, and I feel now I'm that kind of person who I don't really want to live in a big city. And that's why when I was in Turkey, I decided to live in Bursa which is much smaller and quieter than Istanbul. It's still a massive city. So we had all the kind of things we need, but it was quieter. It was, yeah. it, was, it was easier, right? Same here in Morocco. Like when I go to Casablanca, my head starts spinning, like how busy it is and big city and all this kind of stuff. But here in Tanger, it's, it's like a much smaller city. So I think mm. there's a real benefit to being in a place like that as well. And, and, and again, like maybe you find that your hijrah starts with you moving from London to Nottingham like I did or somewhere else, right? Like a better environment for you to raise kids. And all. like, I, I feel like I still love London. I still love to be there and everything. But when I think about like trying to raise children in London, like now it is, I find it scary. I find it scary, right? But maybe about Nottingham, I wouldn't feel that same way. Maybe there's other parts of the UK where I wouldn't kind of feel that way. So I think there's a massive difference between most of the big cities that we Muslims live in generally and being in much smaller cities and, and, and enjoying that environment more as well. Yeah, 100%. Mm. Mm, yeah. Um, why is my phone just turned on? <laughs> my screen just turned on. Anyway, uh, yeah, bro. So is there any, other than like the bank and stuff, were there any, in, you know, inconveniences, challenges when you move there? I mean, from what you told me before, it was like very smooth, but maybe there's something you haven't told me. 
I think, um, like I said, good people make everything easy. Alhamdulillah, right? And I, and I think that that's the key to it. And and you got to remember that this journey I, I'm going on, I've been on the journeys you're going to go on. They're not random. They're not random. They're actually like planned by Allah, right? And I was I give this example of the story that when I came to Morocco to visit last year, um, I was staying. I, I rented a, an apartment, an Airbnb, right? My wife did some research. We rented the Airbnb, um, and I was walking out of the apartment one day, and it was Juma. And I wasn't sure what time Juma was going to start. So I basically stopped the first guy I saw on the street. Random guy, right? And I always do the thing where I just speak to people in English. Even if I'm Turkey, wherever, I just speak English. I just went, bro, I said, do you know what time Juma is? Right? And Alhamdulillah, I was really happy that the guy spoke some English. And he goes, yeah, it's at one or whatever. Right? So then I went, I went Juma, I prayed Juma, I left. Mm-hmm. The very next day, bro... I went to um, the supermarket near near the same apartment complex, right? And I was coming out of the supermarket and he was coming into it. The same dude, okay? Mm. So he saw me, I saw him, I stopped, says Salam Alaikum. And I realized he speaks English. How are you? Started speaking. Where are you from, bro? He's like, oh, he's like, I'm from uh, Lewisham. I'm like, whoa, I'm from London, this, that. Start talking, <laughs> yeah? And he goes, I live in this compound. I'm like, perfect. I'm thinking of moving to Morocco next year. Can I take mm. your number? He's like, yeah, take my number. So I pull out my phone, right? And I type in uh, his number that he gives me. It's a UK number, yeah? He's typing it. I type it in. And as soon as I type it in, I see it says, Kamal. You know, if you finish a number off, it, it, yeah. if the number's there, it's in your dime. I had this guy's number in my phone. Mm. And I was like, what the hell? And I said to him, I said, is your name Kamal? And he was like, like you can imagine if someone random just said, like, yeah, hey, yeah. This guy. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, bro, because the, the way I write numbers down is I actually say how, where I met this guy, who it is, right? right? So this guy, where did I meet him? I met him 21 years ago or 20 years ago in mm. university when I did one of my first ever volunteering. Wow. Okay? And I have not seen this guy in 20 years, bro. So think about the Qadr for that to happen. I could have been one minute earlier to Juma. I could have asked someone else. I could have not seen him. Think about all that to happen for me to find this guy again. Mm. Okay? And then when I found this guy, bro, Alhamdulillah, he's been a huge blessing. He's helped me with everything. He, he looked for apartments for me. He, put the, he even got his money. He put the deposit down. He like, made everything easy. He gave me advice. Even yesterday, bro, my wife was ill. I was telling him that there's no pharmacies open. He's like, give me the medication. Let me go and get it for you, this, that. And, and I'm saying there's people like him, bro, who, who basically make the world of difference to you. And these mm. are people who Allah has sent to make your journeys easier. Mm. You know? So when you're thinking about your journey, you might be thinking, oh, it's very hard for me to think about moving away or this and that. Allah will make things easy. As long as you've got a nice, sincere intention for Allah, Allah will make these things easy. Of course, there's going to be uh, problems and issues and all this kind of stuff, but Allah will facilitate things from you that you can't even imagine. Like imagine if I had tried to plan getting this guy to meet me 20 years later, this it's almost impossible to do, you know? Yeah. So I just think that, you know, you want to have That's that kind of empowering, you want to have that empowering positive mindset to kind of do that. And what I'm saying is that if you find good people, I think it makes everything a lot easier. And and then when you do come up against things, you can still kind of like, you know, uh, handle them because you have someone that knows the language, someone that can do all those things. Yeah. Does he know the language? Oh, he's Moroccan, bro. So he grew up, oh, okay. he grew up, he grew up in here, but then he spent 20 years uh, in, in the UK. But, you know, mm. he, he's Moroccan fully, so, yeah. Right, right, right. Okay, nice. Do you think about, if you stay in Morocco, you know, long time, your kids or, inshallah, your grandkids are pretty much going to be Moroccan. Like, they're going to, especially your grandkids, inshallah, they, if they're born raised there, like, they're going to have that culture fully. Like, what's your reaction to thinking of that, to that thought? It's kind of weird because part of me is like, but hold on, they're Pakistani, right? So there, there's that kind of vibe. Um, but at the same time, I don't know, because it's difficult. Like when you start thinking about um, like uni and all this kind of stuff, I'm like, would I would I go to a uni in Morocco for the kids? If they want to go uni, would we go back to the UK? So I don't know, but I think like I want to have a base somewhere. And I think like having that base is like when you buy a property maybe or something like that. Um, so for me, I think like ultimately being in a Muslim country is great. Um it doesn't really make a big difference, like if their grandkids are Moroccan. This, I don't think that makes a massive difference. Um, my grandkids are going to be Moroccan anyway, inshallah. But I think that it was, it's all about life, and I think it's about the circumstances. And I think that for me, still, I feel like a massive pull to the UK because of my family. You know, if if uh, I wasn't like 
like close to the family, all the kind of stuff. I think maybe I would even be living somewhere else. So for me, like, uh, and a lot of UK people, I think they wouldn't consider places like Malaysia, for example, right? Malaysia could be a really good place to live, but it's 14 hours away or 16 hours away, right? And so I feel like one of the good things about Turkey and Morocco is that they were very, very accessible from the UK, okay? So for example, traveling is two, three hours. Two, three hours is amazing, right? Um, it used to be that me and my whole family would fly from uh, from uh, Turkey to London for like under a thousand pounds, roughly a thousand pounds. Okay, so even like going back and forth is amazing. Whereas I would love to live in Pakistan, for example. Okay, um, but Pakistan's very far; it's like seven hours, and then to no one even flies direct there, and then you got to pay like seven eight hundred pound per person. It becomes very far, right? Whereas Morocco and 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 Turkey is really good. Morocco is even better than Turkey in that sense. My friend who just visited me now, he paid sixty pounds return to visit me. Mm. Bro, you cannot get a train ticket return from London to Manchester, okay? And he's coming from London to Tangier. Mm -hmm. So I, I think like, um, you know, long-term wise, the truth is that Allah takes you wherever he takes you. Um, but like I said, I, I, I really do actually like Moroccan people and I don't have any um, thing around like, oh, my kids are going to be Malaysian or Moroccan or all this kind of stuff. The mo most important thing, obviously, as we know, is that for them to have Iman, and the preservation of Iman, I think, is very, very interesting. One other thing I would say about this is that my heart is connected to the UK, and I do feel like the UK is my country. And I feel that there's Muslims who are there who will probably never leave. Um, and part of my mission in life uh, around, uh, you know, building leaders and doing all these kind of things is I feel like the UK is like my primary place to do that. So I feel very connected to the UK in that. And I feel like I want to go back more physically in the uk and be more on mission there to help build those leaders and do the work that i want to do so i think there's going to be this big connection that that's there forever inshallah but at the same time it's like you want to you want to live in a good place i think mm -hmm. so when you left turkey i remember you were talking about you were you seem to be in a bit more of a medium slash long-term mindset right um and that was part of your decision of going to morocco yeah. but it sounds like yeah even though you've done that and you had that in mind, it's still not this thing where it's like, yeah, of course, in 10 years, I'm still going to be here, right? I think, like, for me, it's probably the family thing. So, alhamdulillah, like, I have brothers and sister and, and they, like, with my parents and all this kind of stuff. I think in the back of my mind, my parents are still there. So I think that's always going to be, like, a, a pull. And I think that deep down, like I said, there's other things about like university or doing work and all this kind of stuff. But for me, long-term, like I said, I would love to have a base here. So have yeah. a base here, for example, my own property where I live. I know this is my home and all that kind of stuff. And then be able to just venture in and out, venture like whether it's six months here, three months there, five months there, um, do all of that stuff. Um, but like I said, I, I really feel there's a lot of barakah. There's a lot of blessings of, of being abroad. I think it's just that family pull that probably affects me more than anything else. And I think yeah. that's, um, you know, that coupled with the impact work, that's it. But if you asked me like, and, and you know, it's funny because if we did this interview while I was in the UK, I think it would be a very different interview. Because <laughs> when I'm here, I'm like, kind of like, yeah, I miss everyone. I miss the community and this and that. But when I go there... I start to see what London's really like. Like I went there recently, right? In the summer. And I was there for like a month and, and stuff. And I was like, you know what? This feels really nice. Like being able to understand everyone, friends, family, community. Like maybe, maybe UK is okay. Riots the next week. <laughs> like literally <laughs> like a sign from Allah. The riots came and all this negativity. And I was like, okay. Like I, I see why this may not be the best place for the future. And mm. so I feel like sometimes you romanticize the the other side. So yeah, I miss family, yes, miss all that. But but in terms of like my health, my health is much better here. My work is much better here. Everything is much, much better being here than being there. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So I think mm. overall it's like, a, it's like I definitely, definitely want to be in a positive uh, environment like this. Um, I think it's just more the parents, the family, all these kind of things that really – uh, pull out you and I think like these are big things to think about like I remember there was one like I said to you before there was the whole money thing I remember there's one family they moved in they came to Turkey they lived there they got a beautiful apartment it was really amazing like compound and all that kind of stuff the first the husband was going back and forth trying to make money in the UK come back come back it didn't work then he couldn't come for a while then COVID hit then and then they just moved away 
because mm. they just weren't settled money wise. Another friend of mine, he moved to Bursa. He actually bought a place. He lived there, um, but his kids just weren't settled in in the schools there, right? So he basically mm. left now. He's moved to Dubai. Um, so I think like you being settled mentally, you being settled financially, you being all these kind of things are really really important. But at the same time, I think if you have this mentality where yeah, I can go back whenever I feel like it. Yes, I can visit. And like I said, I try and do this thing where, you know, my friend was visiting now uh, a few weeks before that. My my sister and my brother came with their kids. And then, um, you know, I had uh, my brother-in-law visit. And then I had my parents visit. Then I, like, I've been here like um, seven, I've been here since February. And I've had like four or five lots of family visit. So I think yeah. that kind of stuff uh, really, really helps. And then there's also benefits and bonuses of being away. So for example, when I go back to London, my mindset is I'm here for a while. I have to see my friend's family community, everyone, right? So then I do this thing where I'm like, okay, uh, let me go meet the brothers at Ayra. Let me go meet the brothers at Al Maghrib. Let me go meet my friends. Let me go meet my cousins. And I do all of that. And sometimes I meet them and I'm like, how's this guy? And they go, I saw, I haven't seen him since I saw you last. And they live yeah. in the same city, bro. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So I think there's this onus that when I do go, it's special and people treat me special as well. Oh, they're like, oh, he's here. He's here for a few a few weeks. and da, da. So it's yeah. a different vibe and it feels really, really nice, you know? And yeah, that's why I'm yeah. saying that I, I don't want to get, I don't want to get tricked into like, you know, when you go on holiday somewhere and you think this is so nice, but then when you live there, you're like, oh, this is not nice, right? Yeah. It's yeah. that kind of vibe, I think. And I know it's like that with my family in Algeria as well. Like some of my family live in other cities, like away from like the main city where my family is. And they won't. They'll see each other once a year for Eid, maybe twice a year for the two Eids, you know. And that'll be yeah. it. So, what do you miss from the UK? What do I miss apart from family? What do I miss? I miss being able to understand people, bro. Like mm. you know, like when you're just walking down the street, or when you're in a shop, and like I love communication, speaking, all this kind of stuff. It's my stuff, right? So, not being able to communicate effectively, openly, and and like in a friendly way and stuff. I think I miss that a lot. Right, that mm. just that general kind of uh, thing. Mm. Um, I think I think I definitely miss the food. I think UK is amazing for like different culture foods and all. Like the variety is amazing. And then you miss like everyday things like fish and chips and like little things like that. Um, mm. I think those are the kind of uh, things that I miss really. And what do you like miss from Turkey? Turkey, I, I miss I miss the whole like the tourism vibe there where you just get in your car, you drive four hours, nice hotel, like very good standard in terms of like the kind of hotels and stuff. Um, I think I miss the driving. Uh, I feel like that's another thing I miss about UK, by the way. The Moroccan driving uh, is really bad. I made a video about this, right? It kind of went viral on TikTok and people were like very negative towards me and people were agreeing with me, right? Mm. Um, and I was saying to them, I, I, I learned to drive in Pakistan. And if you can drive in Pakistan, you can drive anywhere because Pakistan's like much worse than Morocco. But what they were saying is go back to Pakistan. Why are you talking? About I was like, no, Pakistan's worse than Morocco in driving, right? Yeah. But when you drive in Morocco, it's kind of crazy. And like, I miss driving in the UK, like, you know, actually having rules and driving straight mm -hmm. and all of that. And I felt like Turkey was much better, by the way, than Morocco for, for driving. Um, so yeah, that's another thing. That's all you miss, the driving and oh, driving at hotels. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, driving hotels, weather. But mm. like I said, we've got good weather here. And alhamdulillah, yeah. now I'm living a beach life. So before I used to visit the beach. Now we're living like, I live 15 minutes, alhamdulillah, from the beach. So mm. that's really mm. nice uh, here. So like I said, Turkey, Morocco, there's, there's not a huge difference. But I do think like infrastructure, mm. going on holiday, traveling around, all of those kind of things. Bro, one thing that's amazing is, like you were saying, you had a lot of people visit you. That's another element in terms of, uh, picking where you live, not just in a country, but in a like in a city kind of thing. So, yeah, you, I know you live like what fifteen minutes from the airport, and the oh, airport it's... has Indeed. has direct flights um, yes. from London and stuff. Yeah. That is like a very big deal, right? Compared to, let's say you were living in uh, what's Malaysia. closer to you, Nador or Wajda, uh, Wajda, I think. So Wajda yeah. is quite big, but maybe Wajda wouldn't have direct flights. That might make a big difference, right? Yes. And it's so it's actually amazing to like host people, have people over. And also because it's cheap and the flight is short, they could come much more often. They could come for a week and it would, wouldn't be a problem. You know, it wouldn't seem yes. like a, oh, it's like this big thing where we could only do it once every few years. No, like literally every twice a year, they could just come visit yes. you, you know, yeah. um, and you can and, visit and, and that, that, That's actually why I wanted to live in Marrakesh, by the way, bro. 
because mm. people naturally come to Marrakesh, right? right in right, Turkey, right. like I, I drove a lot. So I heard, for example, one of my cousins, him and his family were coming to uh, Antalya. Mm. Okay. So I was like, right, that's it. They're coming to my country, bro. Seven hours in the car, bang, I'm in Antalya. Yeah, okay? yeah. Spend a few days with them, my auntie, my uncle, all this kind of stuff. Uh, amazing. Really good, alhamdulillah, right? Mm -hmm. Three, four months later, I hear one of my cousins coming where? Marmaris, right? Bang, seven hours. Straight Marmaris. Mm. Go meet them, right? So when I moved here now, I was like, look, people always go Marrakesh. Let's live in Marrakesh, okay? Right. Direct flights, all this kind of stuff. But like I said, when I got there, the heat was just terrible, right? Mm. But the great thing is that Tangier actually has direct flights. Like I said, it's like sixty pound uh, return if you get it early and stuff. Um, so it's really, really amazing, you know. In that sense, yeah. a lot of people visiting, and and like I said, I've had I've had like my brother in laws come twice. My mom and dad have come. My brother and his wife came. My brother and my sister came, um, and my friends come now. And this is all just since February. And this is what I'm saying, like well, when it's cheap, and then you know they got somewhere to stay, it's like a free getaway type of thing, you know. Alhamdulillah. So. It's really good. Yeah, right? exactly. I love it, bro. I love hosting people. And I guess the only way that could be better is in Turkey, there's no houses. It's all apartments. So imagine mm -hmm. I had a house, you could host more people in it. Um, or, yeah. you know, like in some countries, houses are very big or like ha you might basically be able to host people in a whole other section of your house, which means they have more privacy and stuff like that. So yeah. that would be cool. But, you know, me psychologically, me flying from Istanbul airport versus Sabiha, even that in my head, yeah. it's like different, yes. you know? But this this is why, like, I think location is so important. And I, this is why I feel like my quality of life has improved since Turkey because of location, okay? Mm. So you imagine, like, you don't like going Sabiha, yeah? Sabiha for mm. me was like an hour and a half, right? Yeah. And then Istanbul was more than two hours away. So when I was yeah, picking yeah, my parents yeah. up or someone, right, they would get in the mm. car after like a really long flight, um, like if they come from Pakistan in direct, whatever, right? And then it's like, okay, now we're going to drive two hours to my house. Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah. That's like long. Yeah. But now, like the location I live in right now, and this is one of the reasons I picked this location, it's an amazing location, alhamdulillah, right? Like I'm 12 minutes from the international airport. I'm 15 mm. minutes from the beach. I'm 15 minutes from the center of town, right? Um, and so like just being in a location like that, I think it changes everything. So now when I pick my family up, like in their mind, they're, they're used to Bursa, right? So they're thinking like hour and a half, two hours will be home, right? And then 12 mm. minutes later, you're sitting in the house. It's like, wow, this is mm. this is amazing. Yeah, know? yeah. So I think setting your life up, like you have to consider these little things that you might not consider. And I think it makes a massive difference. Yeah. We didn't talk so much about the cost of living, but you, yeah. you gave an idea, I guess. Like you can live... Like fifteen hundred pounds, twelve hundred pounds. That's like good. Like if, if some people live, are living, I don't on... think I can live in that much. Honestly, I don't think I can live in that much. Like, okay. I, I was assuming Morocco that because he said people are living on four or five. Yeah, people are. Alhamdulillah. But I think yeah. I think um, Morocco. I found it to be more expensive than when I was in Turkey. Even though yeah. I think my Turkish experience is now outdated, right? Because like prices yeah. have gone up and all this kind of stuff. But I just I just found like um, Morocco to be a lot more expensive, and I found some things to be like really ridiculously priced. Like any time you're in any of these countries, whether it's Turkey, Morocco, if you're getting something from abroad, yeah. it's going to cost you a lot more, right? So for example. British family, we love baked beans, right? How much are baked beans if you go to Aldi, Asda? They used to be like their own brand ones, four, four for one pound, okay? Mm. Over here, I will pay one pound 50 for one tin of beans. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, maybe it's the same for Heinz baked beans and stuff, but like these are everyday beans. I don't even know what the company is and all that, right? Yeah. So anytime you're getting anything imported, it's going to yeah. cost you a lot of money, whether it's chocolate, whether it's this, whether it's that. And mm -hmm. that's why Turkey was very good because Turkey produced a lot of its own stuff. So when they've got, yeah. for example, wafer biscuits, you don't need to buy the imported ones because they've got uh, internal ones and stuff. Yeah. Um, so I think I think like a lot of it's to do with rent. I think if you can get a cheap place to rent, that will really help in your cost of living because if you can find something for like 300 pounds, 400 pounds, um, that's very cheap. One of the benefits of Morocco that we didn't talk about is me being able to bring my car here. And have my car. So I've actually saved on renting a car, which I had in Turkey the whole of my time. Three years, I rented a car the whole time, right? Mm. Um, and that was costing a few hundred pounds a month. In 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 Morocco, I can just bring my car in um, and I can have it here for six months, take it out, then bring it back six months. Um, and I can drive here. Like I've actually, we haven't talked about this again, but I've driven to Morocco three times now from the UK, mm. 
right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's like a, a journey in itself. And at the same time, like you can fill up the car, no worrying about luggage allowances, all this kind of stuff. So when we came, for example, this last time around, we like filled up the car. We're like, okay, we're going to need heaters for the winter. We're going to need, uh, you know, a printer. We're going to need <laughs> baked beans, the car. loads of baked beans. <laughs> yeah, baked beans, exactly, bro. Pot noodles, all this kind of stuff. Just fill up the car and just drive it in, you know? And I think that's been like a really, really amazing thing. And because uh, my wife is half French, we have family in France. So on the way to the UK, we can actually go visit the family, stay there for a few days. It breaks up the journey, all these kind of things. Um, so mm. this is really a beautiful thing about being in Tanger as well. Tanger is literally, I can see Spain when I go to the beach. So it's very, very close to Spain. I can I can even go into Spain. There's a Spanish enclave in in Morocco on the mainland. You can go into Spain and you can do all that. When I need to do a visa run, I just go in there two minutes into Spain, two minutes out, back again. There's a lot of uh, good things about being in the north and being in Tangier, uh, which I found mm. to be really useful for me as a British person. 100%, yeah. If you could just quickly touch on that since you mentioned it, the um, border run, like how does it work? Yeah, so the way it worked in uh, Turkey, for example, is that you as a British person could be in Turkey for three months in any six months, okay? So what that means is that once you spent three months in Turkey, you cannot stay there longer unless you get a residency permit. And that's what I did in Turkey. I got a tourist visa, so all of that kind of stuff. The way it works in Morocco is that every time you enter Morocco as a British person, you get three months, okay? So I enter Morocco today, I get three months. If the three months are about to end, I drive one hour, 20 minutes to Septa, which is part of Spain, but on the Moroccan mainland, okay? I go in uh, to there, I get my passport stamped, and I come back out again. Right. Mm-hmm. So that border run is very, very simple for me. And it basically costs nothing uh, except mm-hmm. obviously driving there. And then you get three months more. So in mm-hmm. essence, someone could actually live in Morocco indefinitely if they were willing to do that border run. And this is one mm-hmm. of the baraka and the blessing of having that little part of Spain there that I don't need to take a ferry or a flight or do anything. I can just get that border run done very, very easily and cheaply as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you don't feel any sense of instability even though you're doing that every three months it's like fine no generally i travel a lot so last year like i said i took so many flights i'd left the country in and out so generally i'm always traveling every within every three months anyway so yeah. when i take a flight out it's going to reset anyway so generally yeah. i don't need to do like a border run um yeah. but sometimes like now for example i've been back for nearly th- uh, three months uh, i'm going to need to do a border run Mm-hmm. Um, probably towards the end of this month. So I'll just go in, go out, and then I'll have another few months. Um, so yeah, it's, it's fine. It's easy. Mm-hmm. Okay, last question. Yeah. How has this experience, obviously you lived in Pakistan, but the experience of living in Turkey, living in Morocco, these are Muslim countries. In that time as well, you went to the UAE, Saudi uh, a few times. How has that shaped or changed at all, if it has at all, your feeling of ummahood and brotherhood and that kind of thing? I I think that um, traveling always expands your mind. And I think I realized that I love being around Muslims. I love working with Muslims. I love being around Muslims. Um, Of course, I appreciate non-Muslims and I love Dawah and all that kind of stuff as well. But I think like, it for me, it's reinforced the beauty of Islam. And you know, when I talk about like being homesick and, and feeling like, you know, you're out of place and you miss home and all, like you can go to a masjid and you go to that masjid and they will pray four fard for dhuhr, just like every other masjid, right? And it will be the same prayer and it'll be Muslims from all over the place. They're just coming and they're just praying. And I think that, I think that, I understand now when, you know, when they talk about the olden days when you could just go from one part of the Khilafah to another part of it just with La ilaha illallah, that's how it feels. Like you can go to all of these Muslim countries, you can be yourself um, and you feel that natural brotherhood, you feel uh, people are willing to help, just normal Muslims, everyday people, right? Like they're just willing to help, they're willing to be good to you and and if they can do something to help, they, they will. Um, and of course that comes from brotherhood, that comes from the Rahmah. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I just love it. I think any country that you go to, uh, any Muslim country, there's amazing Muslims there. Every country has bad and good, but generally people, I found the Muslims to be really good. And it's really, really, um, I think it's really, um, empowering for you to kind of feel that you can go to almost anywhere in the world, uh, and find people who are like, you know, aligned to your values, aligned to your thinking and all this kind of stuff. And the amazing thing is that they're all different. 
right? The Turks are different to the Moroccans. The Moroccans are different to the Saudis. The Saudis are different to the Pakistanis. Everyone's different. But we have this uh, community, this common unity between us, which is beyond everything, right? Like every kind of Muslim you meet out there, his love for the Prophet ﷺ will be top, right? His love for Allah, all this kind of stuff, even if they're not practicing, it will be amazing. And I think that what that does to you is it just makes your environment amazing. And suddenly, like I was listening to one of the non-Muslim gurus yesterday, he was saying, your environment is who you become. Right, and so being in this environment where there is brotherhood, where there is all this kind of uh, goodness towards you, and not that resentment and that negativity towards you being Muslim, all that kind of stuff, I think it makes a massive difference uh, on who you are and who you become as well. Mm, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Would it say? Would you say this is like a big question, but would you say it increased your iman to live in these countries? Yeah, I think I think definitely what's happened to me, I feel that, I think what's happened with me, like when I've come to these countries, I think the quality of life has improved and I think that my gratitude uh, has shot up for a lot of things uh, and being very appreciative of this stuff. And I think being grateful definitely makes you closer to Allah. Um, and so just kind of like living the life that I, I know, like even though I'm living this life, I do understand the lives that most people are living. And I understand even people that are close to me that I love, the kind of life they're living, the pressures they're under and all the kind of things that they're going through and everything, right? Um, mm. But because of that, I'm actually really grateful. And I appreciate like when I have a good weather and I have this and that, I try and like be really, really grateful. And I think that that brings me closer to Allah. I think like being in Morocco, definitely I feel like my iman has gone up. I think having the masjid close by, um, having good people um, and trying to take more, more kind of uh, work towards that, having that stability, Definitely, I think it's really, really helped my iman. And like I said, I, I think it's one of those things that in Islam, there are things that are tangible and intangible. Okay. So for example, like me hearing the adhan, even if I don't pray, I don't practice, me hearing the adhan every day, I believe it has an impact on me. Even if I don't pray and I don't do anything, just hearing la ilaha illallah, hearing the adhan every day, five times a day, I think it has an impact on me, a positive impact on me. Right. So I think mm. there's like real concrete benefits of, of being in a Muslim land, uh, like we discussed already. Mm. Alhamdulillah. Anything uh, else you want to end with, add, comment on? Um, the only other thing I would say, I guess, is that um, people might be watching this episode, people might be thinking about all these kind of things, you know, whether it's the money, whether it's the family, whether it's this, whether it's that. Um, I think the big thing is to, like, take some action. Um, so this friend that came to see me, he's been talking to me about moving abroad and doing hijrah for a long time, okay? And after loads of discussions, back and forth, voice notes, helping him, all this stuff, I said to him, I said, listen, bro, you're thinking about all this stuff. You haven't even come here yet. Like, you haven't even been to Morocco. Mm. And he was like, yeah, that's a good point. And then he found out one of his friends coming anyway, and he was like, okay, how much a flight? 60 pounds? And he's like, he did it, right? Same with me. When I went to Turkey, I was like, let me just go there and see what it's like. Let me go around Turkey. Let me see what it's like. So I would say that if if you're considering this and you actually want to make the move and stuff, just go and test it. Go and check it out. Just go to that place, visit it, um, and take some action. And, and actually see what it's like and experience it. Um, and I think that might change you. Because sometimes it takes you to go somewhere and then realize this is the place. Like one thing we didn't discuss, and I'm going to get hate for this, is that I actually love Dubai, and that was a big, serious condition, uh, serious consideration for me to move somewhere. Right? One of my one of my cousins, he loves Dubai. The first time he went to Dubai, he fell in love with it, and he was like, "I have to move here." He's now living there, alhamdulillah. He's very happy, and he's got a great job and all this kind of stuff. Right? So what I'm saying is that by you going out and actually experiencing, you'll find that can become the catalyst for your journey, mm. inshallah. So just make sure that you don't just watch stuff like this, but you take action as well. Mm, perfect. Yeah, good. Okay, does that call off here, bro? Um, maybe maybe I'll see you in Morocco sometime soon again. Inshallah. Marhaba. Okay, jazakum Allah khairan. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Shalom alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.